Now, as you know, I've had a fascination with gardening by the moon for quite a few years. And this year, I will be running my garden on biodynamic principles. And that's what I'll be referring it to. It's a bit of a curveball to say gardening by the moon because you think you have to be out there at about 10 to 2 in the morning putting in your spinach. But it's all about the moon affecting the water that's in the soil and in the plants. Now, I've caught up with Claire Hattersley, who is a bit of an expert. She's been doing it for about 30 years, and she's been running biodynamic workshops, and she works in a very interesting garden in Derbyshire. And one of the books that that organization brought out is called Biodynamic Gardening. And if you wanted to start off in this vein, get this book. This is sort of the Bible and will give you all the information you need to start your biodynamic journey. Now, I recently caught up with Claire and we spoke about this book and her experiences in biodynamic gardening. Well, then, I think the first question is, what is biodynamic gardening? That could be the million dollar question, Sean. Um... I would suggest that biodynamic gardening is very, very similar to organic gardening in that uh, to be a biodynamic gardener, you wouldn't use any artificial pesticides or fertilizers or anything that really is meaning you're waging war on nature. Um, so biodynamics would be more about looking to the bigger picture. So you're, you're trying to work in harmony with nature and trying to get to optimise what you grow as a crop or what your garden becomes, but by um, trying to work gently with nature. And you're not just looking towards the soil and the soil health, you're actually raising your, your vision up to what's happening in the wider picture. So in the environment, in your uh, local area, in your microclimate, and also looking up to the heavens and the stars. Now, I know what the general reaction will be to that is, so you want me to see what the moon's doing. Well, that's not going to affect it. But if people just think, why do you plant your runner beans mid-spring and not in the winter? It's because you're taking note of the seasons. Yeah. So people are in tune. It's just I don't think they realise they are. So this is just like the next extension to it. And out of all the books that I've bought, this book is the only one that sort of breaks everything down and starts from scratch because I've had to learn from the beginning again because um, what I might think as a, a root isn't a, it isn't because it's classed as a different thing in biodynamics or um, peas. You've got to think about the harvest that comes from the pod. So. To some extent, you've got to forget everything you've ever been taught. Um, but once you get your head around the basics, it's actually quite a simple uh, thing to get into. So let's just briefly talk then. Um, and you can't briefly talk about what I'm going to ask you, but it's like for somebody just new into this, what are the basics about looking at, at where uh, the new moon is and then working back seven days so if somebody wanted to start uh, today with putting some seeds in what are the, sort of the basics and I'm referring to the full moon mm. okay that's a nice question to start with and I think um, I think planting and sowing with an eye to what the moon is doing is actually quite a helpful thing to start because you can see the moon so it's tangible it's a uh, the moon is a real thing in our lives. Um, so I would suggest, first of all, buying a decent calendar, but you can actually access a lot of this information online. Um, so it's really the, the most uh, powerful influence that the moon has on life on Earth is through the moon rhythms. And there are about 37 of these, um, but we can work with just a few just to get started. And the most powerful rhythm is the full moon, new moon. So that's when the moon gets bigger and bigger and bigger and is completely round and full and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is a monthly rhythm. And as the moon is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger, just the week before the full moon is actually when the, the moon is able to influence the water 
within everything on the earth and to actually make um, quite profound effects. And um, when we're sowing seeds, particularly, we want the seed to be able to absorb the moisture that's available in the soil as quickly as possible. What we want as gardeners is a really good, strong, quick germination. So working with that full moon rhythm, the week before full moon, you're actually accessing the moon's influence on the water on the planet and in the soil and in the, the plants and in us. It, it's not just about moving the seas and the tides. It's about all of the water on the earth. So, yes, if you can sow your seeds in the week before the full moon, you're standing more of a chance of actually getting a good, strong germination of your seeds. And that's one of the misconceptions. You don't have to be out at 10 to 12 in the night when there's a full moon. It's just taking that information and translating it. And if now there's a date coming up at the end of this month. And for anybody who wants to follow this, I'll be gardening uh, biodynamically for the rest of this year. So I'll be doing videos as I go. But it's to be taken as a guide. So there's a potato, there's a, a root day coming up, which is a very good day for doing your potatoes. But if you've got three foot of snow outside, then just wait for the next day. It's a bit like getting a seed packet. If the seed packet says plant in March, but there's snow down, then you wouldn't ignore the weather. So it's like, it's another layer of information. So just take it as a guide, not as a gospel, that you have to do things on a certain day. Absolutely. I think that's really good advice. It's important to think about the weather and about the soil warmth and all of the usual things that gardeners have to consider. And working with moon rhythms is just another thing to consider. But what's lovely is when you start to see the results, you start to really recognise that the planets are having quite an effect on life on Earth. And we accept quite readily that the sun has a profound effect. And that's a planet, that's a planet, well, it's a star, but it's up there. It's a part of our universe. And uh, the moon equally has an effect and the other planets can be, um, it can be recognized that they're having an effect on life on earth. And also you can take things step, like step by step. Okay, this book does go into some parts of uh, this, which you sort of think, oh, I can't get my head around what's this about putting a horn into the ground for six months or anything but just start slowly first of all just learn the patterns of the moon and then what to do and then once you've got that under your belt then go on to you know, the next thing it's a bit you don't have to take all this book in on the same sort of day just do things slowly like when you first started doing the gardening now when you start first started how quickly did you see a difference when you started doing things by the moon was it instant or did you have to wait uh, a year or two so i was working as a gardener at Willida um, and growing medicinal herbs and plants kind of growing weeds really it's a bit surreal we grow weeds in straight rows and crop them um but i recognized quite quickly when i started working as a professional gardener that actually um, it's like you tune your senses somehow. So yes, you start to see things like very quick germination in our greenhouses, if we would sow um, trays of calendula, which is one of our larger crops. When we sowed the seeds on the right day, according to the calendar, they would be up in two or three days. It was quite amazing response. And the plants, again, when you use those moon rhythms for planting out and for hoeing, you start to grow really, really resilient, healthy crops. So I would say pretty quickly, I recognized the difference that it made working with these uh, more subtle influences. You kind of fine tuning yourself and your crop as well. And I noticed um, before I became a gardener, I was working in exhibitions and arts, and I noticed how vibrant the colors of the plants were. There was a real vitality. Um, of plants that we were growing under this biodynamic system. So my interest was really um, peaked quite early on and uh, I really felt that it it offered a really, um, a, a great system to work for good crops, but also a great system for tuning myself 
to nature and to the, the more finer aspects. And I think with the pandemic that's been going on, I think people are a bit more tuned into this type mm -hmm. of uh, yeah. thing. And even if you do think it's a bit kooky, that does it matter if it makes everything in the garden better? I remember 10 years ago interviewing Charles Dowdin and the majority of the people were like, oh, he's off his head, he is. He's not put in the zoo. Well. And now, if you want to dig, you keep it quiet because everybody else is doing the no dig method. And it's a bit of a shame. Oh, I can't tell anybody that I'm out there with a spade. I'll go out after dark and do it. And I think this is, a, this is at the very similar spot is it's a bit out there for people, but I think in about 10 years' time, everybody will be doing this, and it'll completely change, because a lot of what we do now in the garden, we learned from the Victorians, and the Victorians got paid to be in their, you know, like the big houses and everything. Yeah. So if a gardener said to his boss, I can get these potatoes in 20 minutes, and then I'll be finished, well, he, he's only gonna get paid for the hour. So if he can do a task that's going to take eight hours a day, saying, oh, I've got to dig all this, you know. So I think we've taken a lot of bad habits from the past. And this mm. is why, even though I've been gardening for 30 years, sometimes it's just good to stop. Yeah. Sort of not forget everything that you've ever been taught, but just put it to one side and take in some new information. And, I think uh, as well, what's interesting, Sean, is science has actually... Um, given us more information, particularly the last 10 years, soil science has really moved on. And there's now this recognition that what I was taught when I went to uh, horticultural college was very much about the physical aspects of the soil and the chemistry of the soil, but nobody really talked about the life in the soil. It was more, well, if you've got worms, that's a good sign and we'll move on. But now it's been recognised that the, the biology of the soil has been left out of the picture which is why we've had this um, degradation of soils, particularly agricultural, but also, you know, gardens can be a bit lifeless. And the more we think about replenishing the life in the soil, which is what biodynamics is also about, the, the whole manure that you mentioned, the main purpose of it is to bring life back into the soil. And the more life there is in the soil, the healthier the soil is, much like our own uh, biome. There's this now a recognition that the healthier and more diverse the life is in our own stomachs, all of the microorganisms that do the, the kind of assimilation and the processing of our food, the more life there is in us, the healthier we are. And it's exactly the same pitch with the soil. So one of the principles of biodynamics is that you promote and encourage more life in the soil. Therefore, everything that grows in your soil has got more access to all that it needs and is better crops, better food for us, and more vital. Oh, I don't know if I'm correct in thinking this, but this is how I'm trying to process it in my own head. So there's a process where you take a horn, mm. and you put manure into the horn, yeah. and then you bury it, is it for six months? Yes, you bury it for the winter time. And then you lift it, and then yeah. you uh, stir it for an hour. I'll go into this in more detail yeah, when yeah. I get to it. But you um, stir it for an hour, and then you walk around the garden, scat sort of scattering it all over the place. Now, in my head, I've processed this as what you're doing is sort of basically making feed. So you're sort of throwing uh, the mycorrhizal fungi around the place. And that's a word that was never on the scene, even up till five years ago. Yeah. If you mentioned that, people were going, oh, he's, he's gone. But people have understood now that there's a lot more going on underneath that soil. So yeah. even though this, this preparation of the horn might sound a bit kooky at the moment, that's how I'm thinking. It's just, mm -hmm. oh, just putting some more mycorrhizal fungi down or... or yeah. Or you're feeding what's already there. So you're feeding all those little microbes. It's like, an um, say, like uh, if we use the soil stomach kind of analogy, you have the right kind of foods, the bacteria in the yogurt and the kind of ferment foods that you know will actually create the right sort of balance. 
and the whole manure is like an inoculant. So you kind of scattering the microorganisms around, which will duplicate. We know how fast bacteria can grow. And we know how effective very small organisms are. We've only had the pandemic to show us that something tiny can actually stop the world. So the, the, the life in the soil is um, key, really. And yes, biodynamics and the horn manure is all about bringing the right sort of life and the right sort of balance. And it all starts with cow manure because the cow manure is actually the best match in all of the domestic animals, the best microbial match for the soil life. So it's the best fertilizer. And what you're doing is kind of making it, you're charging it up, you're making it more potent than if it was just the fresh from the cow. It's strange how when I started in the 80s and the 90s, you were always taught to feed the plants. So you'd go out, you'd feed the plants every week. Yeah. And then it changed to feed in the soil. Oh no, yeah. you've got to feed the soil and the soil feeds the plants. And in the last five years, it's now changed to... You've got to feed the life in the soil, which feeds the soil, which then feeds the plants, which then yes. feeds us. Absolutely. And I know that when I have had my uh, depression in the past, that I realized when I was taking those yogurts, mm. those, um, oh, I forget what they're called now, uh, the yogurts you take in the morning with all with the microbes in. Yes, and yeah, yeah. I took them and I realized the depression started to lift. So I thought maybe this is a coincidence. So I stopped take I stopped taking them and I went back to how I was in the past. So I went to go and then investigate. And I've discovered that there is an element that's in these drinks that has been proven to lift to a depression. Yeah. Whereas all this ten years ago, you just you just didn't know about it. Yeah, uh, or it would have sounded odd. It would have sounded completely bonkers that your mood can be affected by your stomach. That's yeah. that would have just sounded complete nonsense. And I think again, we 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 stepped. We're very clever as human beings. We we're very innovative, but we're not always wise. And I think the further we get from understanding bigger pictures, the less we are connected into something that's actually balanced and healthy. Um, so I think biodynamics, again, is a great vehicle to reconnect with natural rhythms. So we have the seasonal rhythm, planetary rhythms, and then also the life rhythms as well. So it's, it's also, just... It's really to explain to me about, because there's, a, there's a, a daily rhythm as well. And also, yeah. just touch on what you told me before about um, herbs. They're better oh, to yes. be in the morning than they are in the afternoon. That's right. So traditionally, um, herbalists would always collect herbs early in the morning, um, often while the dew was still on. So it would ensure that that was really early in the morning. And what they were doing was plugging into Earth's natural rhythm. So there's this recognized um, breathing rhythm that the Earth has. And again, it's to do with the organisms in the soil there's a respiration going on and there are higher levels of oxygen at certain times of day. So effectively that the earth and the soil breathe in in the afternoon and evening and exhale, breathe out in the morning, which is why you can prove this yourself. If you harvest a lettuce in the morning and a lettuce in the evening, you can actually see which one will keep better. Um, and the herbalist knew as well, and now it's obviously science backs it up, that something like mint, for example, loses its active pharmaceuticals, its APIs, we call them in the trade, active pharmaceutical ingredients. They actually lower and reduce significantly around about lunchtime, about noon. Hence, it, it's, it's actually essential that they get harvested in the morning. Uh, to be effective medicines. So, so again, you, these are quite simple things that you kind of think, oh, yeah, of course, it's kind of obvious, really. But what we've done over our separation from nature and from the wisdom in nature, we've kind of become more mechanistic in our thinking. So we think everything is just clockwork and we don't have to think too much about quality and things like that. So, yeah. Yes, because I was reading it in this book that there are certain times to cut down trees. Mm. And as soon as you read it, and it says things like, if you cut it down on this day, 
it will cut easier and it yeah. will store better because there's less water in the tree. You sort of think, well, that's so obvious. Why the hell didn't I know that? <laughs> and and the reason we don't know it is because we've invented machines that make it very easy to cut down trees, whatever. But if we were still having to cut a tree down by hand, that's the information that would still be really relevant because it would make life much easier if we actually cut the tree down when the sap is more descending. So there's this two two weekly rhythm, this fortnightly rhythm that the moon has an effect on how strong the sap is rising in a tree. So if you choose the rhythm, the part of the month when it's actually less sap and less pressure, then you'll make life easier. But yeah, mechanistic thinking has meant we can just do anything anytime. It doesn't really, you know, it's not a problem. But that's a lot of the issues of the, particularly with timber, the way trees are grown now and the way trees are harvested, you don't actually get good quality timber very easily now because it's grown too quick, too soft, it's just pushed up. Um, again, fertilizers and mechanistic thinking, it's all about volume and uh, quantity rather than quality. Now, what I quite like about, there are lots of things that uh, I like about this way of of doing things, but there's one element that when you look at the, at the calendar, you get gray days and gray days, will teach you that you just sit in the garden, don't do anything, because it's a bad day for the garden. Yeah. Well, I've interpreted that as a grey day to me is a day when you sit in the garden and drink tea. <laughs> Perfect. So you can even take a positive when you're not supposed to be doing anything. And I think that's what a lot of people forget, especially mm. people who have plots. They turn up at their plot, they do it, and they go home. I think a lot of people have actually forgotten about just sitting down and just enjoying the space. And I think a lot of people will take that from the lockdown. Mm -hmm. They just sit down and enjoy the surroundings. Absolutely. And I think, that, again, that makes you a better gardener because you're kind of tuning in. It's, it's like um, a sensing of what, what's doing well and, and also appreciating and loving your garden. You need time to actually just sit and stare. Um, one of the joys that I find of biodynamics as well, you mentioned the horn manure and you have to stir the horn manure in water for an hour. And I see that as a little gift of time as well. It's a time when you're, you're in a more contemplative mood. You can't rush that. You've got to give it the whole hour. And it's it changes your thinking. It's like a kind of meditation. And I think, again, those those moments in the garden are when you actually really deeply connect with the the life in your garden and the energy of it and just yeah make it a very personal connection and i think biodynamics encourages that relationship with the gardener and their garden now i noticed when i started i would try and save some money so i'd get my packet of seeds i'd put one seed per cell and spend hours doing it and the germination, it was okay, but it wasn't fantastic. But then I noticed the cells where two or three seeds had fallen in were better. So I came up with this theory that they can sense when there's another seed there. Therefore, a competition starts, which can grow the best. <laughs> and then as soon as you've discovered which one is growing the best, you then kill the other two by cutting the tops off. Um, but... I think that's a part of it as well, is when you would, are doing things, if you put out the good intentions, you mm. get them back. Mm. And I think that's what Green Fingers is all about. Yeah. Oh, she's got green fingers, he's got green fingers. It's just they're a bit more in tune with, oh, it's a bit cold today, I won't put my seeds out. Whereas yes. the person that's just started, has, like there are so many people at the moment that have put seeds in. And I think they'll become they'll become unstuck rather yes. soon. Yeah, well, they'll they'll run out of space in the greenhouse very quickly. That's the trouble. But again, that's an experiential thing, isn't it? You learn as you grow, and that's again part of this. The challenge of these all these gardening programs, it's kind of instant success, and we forget that actually learning is failing. That it's an essential part. And just to comment on the idea of your seeds in competition, I see it as different to competition. I see it as um, working together in a kind of symbiosis 
And that's why um, in Walida Gardens, we try not to weed every single weed out. Um, we try to recognize that sometimes plants need other plants to help them grow. And this has been recognized in this whole mycorrhizal relationship that's happening in the soil, that, that there's, there's cooperation going on. It's not all competition. Um, and the idea of like, everybody fighting for the same nutrients. It's, it's not always the case. Sometimes plants give nutrients to other plants and recognize in a way that they build a healthier picture working together. So um, I, I very much like the idea of, I sow three beetroot seeds, two or three seedroot, beetroot seeds in each module. And I actually let them carry on growing together as a threesome. And okay, I might not get a monster beetroot, but I actually like smaller, uh, less woody vegetables and, and they grow well together because that's how it seems to be that the the natural world is more cooperative than we ever imagined. And in fact, that's what uh, companion planting is all about. Plants yeah. that go well together, they feed off each Absolutely. other. Yeah, it's supportive. It's a, a kind of cooperation picture rather than competition. Now, Explain to me, you've mentioned it a few times, what is the Walida and is it a space that's open to the public? Okay, so Walida is, we're an international company um, and we have one headquarters manufacturing centre and garden in the UK. It's right in Derbyshire and that's where I've worked for 20 odd years. I've stopped counting. Um, and I was a head gardener there for a few years. And... Um, we have a 13 acre garden where we grow medicinal plants to make natural medicines and natural cosmetics. Um, the garden in normal times is open to the public. We um, do organized tours that people have to book in. And we also have an annual open day. Of course, the pandemic changed everything last year. And we're not really sure whether we'll be able to open as an open day. We are hoping to run a few small workshop, workshops in the summer, uh, COVID rules allowing. Um, but yes, in more normal times, we, we're very happy to have visitors and organise groups and run workshops. Now, one thing that people might want to know about is you work with the phases of the moon and everything. Now, you're still going to get slugs and snails. Mm. Uh, how do you deal with them? Is there a, is there a magic portion that you've got that will? Because I've heard of I've heard of something, but I haven't looked into it yet. But it's a pretty gruesome uh, process. But I'll just tell you what I've heard, and then you can tell me. You collect your slugs, you cut them up, you put them into a bucket for about a month, and then after a month, you strain them. And with that juice, you go around the garden and you water the garden. And I'm assuming the slugs will come along and they can go, oh, I, I sense death. I'm out of here. And yeah. they just go. Now, is yeah. that something that I've just dreamt or is there a bit of truth? <laughs> <laughs> you must have funny dreams. No, it is, it is true. That's one of the things, one of the methods. It's called slug soup. Uh, that's what we call it anyway. Um, yeah, so... That for me is always the last resort because I would choose not to try to kill things in the garden. What, what we've done at Walida in, uh, in the past is we recognize the vulnerable plants and we will create barriers for around the plants to stop the slugs accessing them. Another thing I've always noticed is if you grow your plants well, this is particularly early on in the season, but if your plants are growing well, if, if you use um, the right time for planting out and for hoeing and, and they're, they're growing strongly, quite often the slugs aren't drawn to them. And I've, I've noticed that slugs are more drawn to plants that are in stress. Um, so the key is to grow your plants as well as you can, tend them as well as you can, and you will hopefully not attract the slugs in. However, later on in the season, it's quite difficult to control slugs. And yes, slug soup is one. Um, you can drown the slugs. You don't even have to cut them up. It's an, a lingering death in a, a bucket of water with a tight fitting lid. But the smell is horrendous. And there's another bird. Now, now, is that the water or the beer traps? No, the, the water is, is, is a bucket full of water with a tight fitting lid, and you collect your slugs and put them in, and the water 
as you say, you sieve out the, the dead plant, um, dead slugs, and that water is a deterrent. I think it smells of death to them. There is another way, which is perhaps a little and less... It does, and it does smell. Oh, it's the, disgusting, yeah. I've experienced the smell. So if, there's anybody, if there's anybody on your allotment site that you don't like, <laughs> drain your slug juice when the wind is going in that... It's, you know, it's no worse than the comfrey. You know, comfrey josh is a bit pongy as yeah. well, and nettle josh. It's those kind of uh, smells that, yeah, is part of it. But, but there is another method which, um, again, I think it details in the biodynamic book. But there's also other places online you can get information, and it's called a, an ash. And what you do is take some slugs and you burn the slugs in a on a wooden fire but you have to try and keep the ash of the slug separate so that's a challenge because they don't normally catch fire easily and that ash you then use you have a few processing steps but it's also sprinkled around as a deterrent to the slugs and you're kind of interrupting their natural cycles really that's the aim of it and um i think you have to be fairly consistent with application that's the key to it you can't just do it once and expect a miracle you have to be quite consistent and dogmatic. Um, so for me, the preferable thing is to identify the plants that might be vulnerable and actually create barriers. We've had a lot of success with horticultural fleece that you create a kind of framework with wire and posts and you dig the fleece around the edges and then fold it over the wire and uh, use uh, clothes pegs. And it's this flexible um, horticultural fleece membrane that the slugs won't climb up so you can use that to stop any slugs migrating in and then there's always the nematode mixes as well which again I I kind of feel a, a something to use as the last resort but they do work particularly on small areas. I've actually seen a slug abseiling down my <laughs> greenhouse because I had put all my seeds into a tray and it surrounded the tray with with uh, water, I think it was. Yes. And he actually abseiled down onto the yeah. plant and ate it. Yeah. And it's like, I think that's what people forget sometimes. It's, I've got some cabbages and cauliflowers at the moment and the leaves are starting to, like the leaves at the bottom are starting to die. Mm. It's far more beneficial to spend an hour going through, picking up all the dead stuff. Because yeah. like you said, pests, Want to feed off, want to yeah. feed off that. So if your garden's clean, then yeah. in theory, uh, if, if we didn't have slugs, I mean I've come to terms with them because if we didn't have slugs, we would be up to our necks in plant waste. They are part of the cleaning up process of nature and the assimilation. So we kind of we it's just a way of working with them rather than feeling you're at war with them. And I agree, sometimes it's completely exasperating, and drastic measures are always on the cards for some some crops but i think avoiding the proprietary pellets and the things that we know do damage other life in the garden is is to be avoided really well thanks to claire for joining me and i'm sure she'll be appearing throughout the year so if you want this book i will put uh, details in the description below where you can get it along with a link right i'm going to have a cup of tea now and i'm going to consult the calendar to see what i should be doing in the garden this week. So until next time from me, bye for now.